Yeah, I'm sure it's recording. Yeah. That's well, it's recording now. I, I'm pretty sure it was recording before, too, because it stopped it and had a picture of me. So, okay. so I'm sure that it, it was recording prior to that. Let us okay. continue. All right, yes. So the doctrine of free will. Again, what I was saying is that we will be looking at some of those scriptures again tonight in uh, refuting free will, but we're going to be doing it specifically with the idea of free will in mind, what we mean by that. So what do we mean by free will? Well, there have been different answers to this over the years. Um, but we see that it's made up of two parts, right? See, it's made up of free and will. And so we always have to ask the question, what do you mean by freedom? You know, you, it, it's, it's, it's free to do what, right? I mean, that's what we're asking ourselves. When somebody says, well, what about free will? You have to ask yourself, well, free to do what? What do you mean, free to do what? Or free from what? What are you free from? You know, what is it that you're, you know, if you say I'm free and you were a slave and you were living in the South and somebody came and said I'm free and it was a black guy, you'd probably understand that he meant he was being freed from being a slave. And that meant I'm free to do certain things. But you always have to ask yourself the question, okay, you're free to do what and you're free from what? What do you mean when somebody says free will? You know, what's, what are we free to do? And then the other can, part of this is will. That is, that is, what is a will? No less. <laughs> what does a person mean by will? Now, there are uh, generally three answers that are given to this, uh, and this is where Christian Arminian theology has overlap with the world, okay? Because the world wants to believe that it's free, with the exception of a couple of philosophies out there that actually either deterministic philosophies and psychologies that don't believe in free will. But for the most part, you have the world the world's definition of free will, and then you have the Arminian, or what's sometimes called the semi-Pelagianism, semi-Pelagian, okay? I'm so glad there's not a spelling. Semi, well, you wouldn't, you, you'd have to look all these up, <laughs> double check me. You got world right. Is it Pelagian? <laughs> Arminian. I got Arminian right too. I got semi Pelagianism. Is it Pelagian? Pelagian with an N. Pelagian. Pelagian. And then you have um, the, sometimes it's called the Reformed. I called that the first time I was here, or the first time we gathered to talk about these things. But it's more, it's broader than just the Reformed. It's more, uh, more correct to say the Augustinian view. Because more than just the Reformed people held that throughout the years. Uh, Luther held it. Luther held the Augustinian view of the will of man. Is that what we call him? The, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Calvin was, Calvin and Luther were basically in the same vein of, of Augustine. Okay. So and they took Augustine's ideas and then reformed the Catholic Church. But Luther started the Lutheran branch of the Reformation. Oh, that's right. You had the... And then, uh, there were Calvin was part of what's called the Reformed branch. He didn't start it, but he was part of that branch called the Reformed branch. And within Catholicism, what was the Arminian view called? I forgot. It's, it wasn't called anything. It was just a, well, there was, Aquinas, Aquinian view was kind of that view. I mean, okay. But there was, there was no one view that, that was held by like a, like a champion of that view. Because there wasn't really, it wasn't really questioned. You know, it was questioned here and there, but it was more or less an unspoken truth. There wasn't anybody, you know, this high rival guy talking about free will. Pelagian did, but Pelagian was a heretic because he didn't believe that we were under the bondage of sin at all. That we are only under the bondage of sin due to influence, not due to nature at all. Okay. That's the only way that, that uh, sin uh, had us. So technically so, you could become perfect. Yeah, it, yes, in the Pelagian view you could become perfect. So, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, a little, <laughs> yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that here. Okay, so let's start here, and then I'll move it over here, and then I'll show because this is a little bit divided. This is a little less divided. 
So the Arminian view of free will and what they mean free from and free to do what is they do mean that they're under the influence of sin. They mean that. They, they genuinely mean that they're under the influence of sin. Um, but, as you know, in Arminian theology, that sin hasn't affected them so much that they can't cooperate. So they can cooperate with God or reject God's grace. And that's what they mean by the freedom. So freedom for the Arminian in this idea of free will is the ability to, is, is you are under the influence of sin, and you might radically be under the influence of sin, but you are free to either cooperate with God's grace or to reject God's grace. Okay? So that's in the end what makes the difference. God holds out his hand to you, he holds out his hand to Peter, he holds out his hand to Judas, and then the other person has the ability within themselves to cooperate or reject God's grace. So this is kind of what's called the sick model. We talked about this on the, on the last one. Uh, and how evangelical a person is kind of depends on how sick you think he is. So there, the Arminian model would be like, he's sick, he's really super sick, he's even sick unto death, you know, and he's going to die, he's on the edge of death, and here comes Jesus with the life-saving medicine, and he can't live without Jesus, he couldn't live without somebody taking the medicine and bringing it right to him and putting it to his lips and all that stuff, but he still has the freedom to cooperate or reject that grace of God, so he's sick. Now some people, in, in uh, this is always funny to me, because some people will say, well, I'm not Calvinist or Arminian. And they think Arminianism's way over here and Calvinism's way over here. And they're actually to the left of Arminianism. And Arminianism uh, is actually, you know, sick unto death. But there are Christians walking around who think we're sick, but we're not sick unto death. You know, we still, are, you know, we still do good things and all that stuff. We're not sick unto death. Yes, we need Jesus. We can't be saved without him. We are sick. We are influenced by sin. But boy, sick unto death, boy, that's a little too much. Some people think that. So Arminius was actually kind of more in, in um, line with Reformed theology in some ways than even modern synergists or modern mm. semi-Pelagians. Um, and the Augustinian view is that we are dead. We're not sick, we're dead. And dead means what we have seen that it meant in the past. It's Jesus said, no one can see. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he has been born again. What do you call people who can't see? Blind. Blind, Blind okay. He says, why do you not hear my words? Because you cannot, or why do you not hear you the things deaf. I say? Mm. You cannot hear the things, cannot. Um, so, deaf. Uh, it says, well, it says all kinds of things. Cannot come, cannot come to Christ. Um, it says all kinds of things about this, about this spiritual condition. We can't come, we can't respond, um, we can't will ourselves to be born again. Now, we can cooperate with God, we can reject God. Now over here in the world, they have different, they have different ideas of what it means to be free. However, the one thing that the world has in common is that, is, is that whatever we are under the influence of, it's not sin. So they'll split off into a million different directions, uh, and we don't have time to trace them all down here. But basically, they mean that they're not under sin. And what these people mean, some Arminianism and some here, um, mean that you're free. What they mean by freedom of the will is free to do the contrary. Okay. Free to do the contrary. So you go to the store and you buy ice cream and you buy vanilla ice cream, but you could have bought chocolate ice cream. Okay? So that's what they mean by freedom. They mean that you are free to 
choose the contrary. You're free to choose the contrary. This is what this means too, but free to choose the contrary in terms of salvation. So you still mean free to choose the contrary, but in terms of salvation. Okay? Over here, this is your dead. Now, I, does that mean we don't have a will? Okay? We have a will. So I'm going to argue here for what's called genuine will. Okay? And I mean genuine. I don't mean free. What's the word under death? Under death? Dead? Death. Oh, death, come. You can't come. Can't come. Can't walk. Can't, can't walk, believe. can't see, can't... You can't you're, 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 you cannot come to can't or respond to Christ. You cannot come to or respond to Christ in your unregenerate state. Now, genuine will means that... Now, first of all, what do we mean by will? Well, we mean the ability to act without compulsion. Okay, that's what I mean by genuine will. Now, we are going to see that even that God overrides on occasion. Right, so okay, we will see that in a minute. But generally speaking, what we mean by will is that you act without compulsion. I mean, you chose to come here. You chose to come here. No one twisted your arm. When the unbeliever sins, no one's twisting their arm. When you come to the unbeliever and say, hey, you need to believe in Christ, and they say, no thanks, no one's twisting their arm. It's not free, but it's genuine. They say, oh yeah, I don't want Christ, no thanks. When you came to Christ, you said, hey, I want Christ. It was a genuine decision. It was a real decision. But that doesn't mean it was a free decision, okay? So, genuine will versus what I would say free will or... This, this here would be life. God bless you. Yeah, God bless you. So you're alive. So alive, sick. But it could be free, though. Right? Dead. What? It could be genuine and free, though, right? It could, it could be. If it's, if, it's, uh, if it's free, then it certainly is genuine. But if it's genuine, it doesn't necessarily say that it's free. But it could be. Yes. All right. Okay. I, I, I was okay. So free and genuine are not the same, necessarily tied to one another. So all horses have four legs, uh -huh. but not all four-legged animals are horses. Okay. So all right. Um, now I'm going to argue here, and what we've argued in the past, and why I reject these views here, is that we are not free. Our freedom is restricted, according to the Bible. It's restricted by a number of things. But the primary way in which God restricts our freedom is by our nature. Okay? Our nature. In other words, you act in accordance with your nature. You do what you want to do. Okay? I don't see how there could be any greater freedom than that. I mean, really, quite honestly, you do what you want to do. The problem is in what you want to do. I mean, that's the problem, is in what you want to do. But you do what you want to do. That's why I say it's genuine freedom. I mean, from our perspective, it's not like you were under compulsion. You, hey, you showed up and you did what you wanted to do. But our freedom is restrained by our nature, among other things. Among other things. And what I mean by this is that we are, we are not free to do... God says we can't do. Okay? Whatever freedom you think we have, you're not free to do what God says you are incapable of doing. Well, wouldn't that be number two? Why would that be under nature? Because that's a result of your nature. God... God on occasion, and we will see this, comes down and physically restricts people. Okay, you violate your free will outwardly. But God is a little bit more clever than your genuine will. If God is a little bit more clever than that, is that he gave you a nature. Uh, and your nature 
dictates what you what you want to do. It dictates what you are. Okay, so for example, it says we're blind. Well, can a, is a blind person free to see? No. no, he's not free to see. He may want to see, but he's not free to see. Okay, so if a person's blind by nature, you can talk about free will to the live long day. He is certainly under a restriction. He can't see. A deaf person can't hear. He's not free to hear, okay? He doesn't have that type of freedom. And the Bible says that we, in our nature, cannot please God. And we'll look at a couple of verses again, just, to, just so that we understand this as far as answering this objection to free will is concerned. Okay, so let's look again at Romans chapter 8. verse 5 it says for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the flesh and not on the thing and uh, sorry, set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit for to set your mind on the flesh is death but to put your mind on the spirit is life and peace for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God for it does not submit it to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Okay? It doesn't say will not. It doesn't say may not. It says cannot please God. Okay? So it says that we're free 